What's up, everyone? We are at Harvard Medical School with Dr. Joel Salinas. Hi. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for the invitation. This is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Joel is a assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, also a neurologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Department of Neurology, and a neurologist at the McCant Center for Brain Health, along with being the author of Mirror Touch, and he's a superhero movie buff. He loves comics. He's <laughs> obsessed with cheese and nature. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Let's dive right in. All right. Let's do it. So how did you know that you wanted to get into neurology and help people? Let's see. I think, you know, growing up, I always had the sense there was something really different or odd about me. And I just kind of chalked up being, being this, like, really weird kid. And I think one of the things that came along with that just was just really being observant of the people um, around me and understanding like how and why they were doing what they were doing. And through school, I found that I just really love science. And I just saw like that was the thing that really tied everything together was just human behavior. And in undergrad at Cornell, I studied biology and sociology. I did research in the Amazon studying why people decided to continue to drink contaminated water and eat contaminated fish. I was just like fascinated about how all this came together. And, uh, and then also just seeing how, how helping other people just felt so amazing for a number of different reasons. And that kind of got me into medicine. And then I still remember the, the specific lecture that just like just blew my mind open. Uh, it was uh, this one lecture talking about the split brain it was just like a, like a regular didactic session. And I don't know if you're familiar with the split brain, but essentially uh, back in the day, one of the things that they would do to treat seizure was a surgery called a corpus callosotomy. So essentially, so you've got your two hemispheres of the brain, left and right, and there's, there's kind of wiring that connects the two hemispheres. And so if someone has a seizure on one of those, uh, it can cross to the other side. And people that didn't have good treatments for seizures, what they would do is just cut the connection. So they wouldn't get the seizures crossing over the other side. But what was just really fascinating is these people, maybe their seizures were a little bit better, but then they were acting a little funny. And one of the ways that they were acting a little funny was they might uh, start kind of buttoning up their shirt, but then their right hand might be unbuttoning the shirt while they were buttoning with their left. <laughs> or they, uh, they, they, the brain you know, the, a, a lot of language is found on the left side of the brain and the right has a lot of kind of visual, spatial kind of attention function. And they were finding that it was, this split in the brain essentially turned people into two people within a single body. Mm. And that just like blew my mind. Just the idea that, that our consciousness, who we are, could be divided into smaller parts. It just like, felt like, it just felt right. And it was just, I, mean, I got goosebumps. Uh, so that, that was like, I wanna work with the motherboard of reality. And be, being in neurology lets me to treat patients, uh, you know, with, with this, with the whole nervous system, which is, I think about having impact on someone's life and what more impact can you have than helping to treat someone's sense of reality, their whole universe. Yeah, you, you list all these amazingly fascinating social and behavioral aspects of the way that our mind perceives reality as well as the way that our, uh, that our brain can be altered. And if our brain gets altered in these ways, it, it changes our behavior. And it's so interesting to observe reality and be able to, to pluck away at how things actually work, how humans actually work, and how you can help people along the way. Yeah. And all right, so for these years, what, what have been some of these coolest things that you've been uncovering, that you've really been enjoying? Mm. Well, I think, you know, in addition to becoming like a, like a physician, like learning this like medicine and becoming kind of like a mechanic of the body um, has been like just like really eye-opening. But specifically in neurology, I think one of the things that really, that really was eye-opening was just seeing just how many differences there are in, just the pre in human presentation, how every little experience that we have, every kind of past um, kind of environment that we've been in 
helps to shape our brain. And that's in addition to like every, every gene, everything that's going on in our body. Like all these things come to, together to create a person at that moment and that's constantly changing. Yeah. Uh, so it's like seeing patients who have all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, diseases and things from stroke to Alzheimer's disease to autistic uh, kind of spectrum disorders to the, to the degree where they're kind of impaired in their day-to-day -day functioning to people who have spinal cord injuries to peripheral nerve injuries like all these different things really shape a person's life and their experience of of the world around them yeah and just seeing how I don't want to say that it's fragile. I want to say that it's resilient. How resilient kind of human perception yeah. really is. Yeah. Um, and just how broad that experience can be and how one person's reality can be completely different and mutually exclusive from another person's reality. Just totally irreconcilable. And they can be sitting right next to each yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the, the statements that I've heard that really kind of landed home for me was just this idea that all you will ever know is the state of your own nervous system. Yeah. Which is just incredible, yeah. right? It, it, and it's beautiful in so many different ways. Like you, you could definitely like see that as like very depressing, right? Like the human condition means that we're all kind of this organ locked away in this dark skull yep. and we're all just trying to figure it out. But at the yeah. same time, I think it just opens up to so many opportunities that we can connect with each other and how we can all kind of come together to create this larger, more cohesive, thing that's just amazing yeah <laughs> yeah we we talk a lot about the hundred billion people that have lived and died to build this beautiful world that we live in today and how though that was all whatever a hundred billion different s brains locked inside of skulls but then somehow through their subjective personal experiences they all also managed to collaborate collectively to build the hospitals and the schools and the economies and the political right. systems and the ubiquity in water and food and energy yeah. and so once we get to a point of understanding that okay we are in different vehicles right now mm -hmm. but we are also part of this greater intelligence exactly exactly and you know as even as we're interacting right now, our brain will not be the same at the end of this conversation. Exactly. And so I'm shaping your brain, you're shaping my brain, yeah. the whole environment is shaping my brain. I, I love this idea that the brain, a, a better metaphor than just thinking of the brain as, as a computer uh, would be to think of it as uh, an analogy. <laughs> just think, uh, would be uh, to think of it as, as a liquid that it, it, you know, we evolve so that way our brain can fit into any environment. Like we're born yeah, that's good. with all of the, the blueprints and kind of the substance to adapt to, to any environment. Because you could be plopped into a different country tomorrow mm -hmm. and you would be able to adapt. You'd figure out how to get water, how to get food, how to learn the language, how to learn the culture, how to play the music. Absolutely. I mean, it, and when, we were, uh, when our brain is at its most plastic, meaning that it's most kind of open to making new connections, yes. is when we're like born. Yeah. And it's just incredible to see how much we can learn in such a short period of time and how those things that we learn very early really do have an impact on the trajectory of our lives. Uh, so there's some beautiful work done looking at language development. And yeah. this is, it's not just language, it's like everything, but um, yeah. studies looking at how kids learn, how, how learn language. So for example, kids um, very, very early uh, in a household that speaks um, only English, for example, can still pick up minor differences in other languages. So um, in this one study, they have a kid kind of plopped in the mom's lap and there's a researcher in front of them and the researcher's like showing them a little toy and while they're being shown this little toy, there's a recording being played that plays either um, ba, that's right, da or da. So da or da, you, you, it's, wow. it's hard to tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, it, it, they're two different common Hindi uh, sil uh, syllables. So da and da. And what they kind of train the baby to do is as they're playing da, 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 at some point it changes to da, and when that happens, they, put, they have like a little bunny in the corner that lights up and plays the drums. And so the kid learns that whenever there's a change uh -huh. to look to the bunny. Wow. And so you, you, you know that the, the, the kid has learned this because once they change, even when the bunny's not lit up, they're looking for the bunny to, to light up. Their acuteness and sensitivity right. is increasing so much. Right, right. And now after about 10 months old, if you were to do that with, uh, with another baby, also kind of only in an English speaking household, uh, they wouldn't be able to pick up that difference anymore. You could play ba or da, and wow. they, they wouldn't look toward the bunny anymore. Um, and you can see that also in languages like Spanish, 
where uh, uh, I si, see how yeah. 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 So uh, the difference between ba and va uh -huh. is something that people who speak only Spanish can't pick up on uh, as easily as people who speak English, for example, or the difference between la and da. Uh, in Japanese, so in the Japanese-speaking household, the L sound and the R sound are kind of con kind of converge somehow. But th these are this is just how our, our brain shapes, and to me, these pieces really come together and influence the rest of your life. And that's not just for language, but also, you know, what you perceive as being like affection or good or not good, or just how, like what you perceive as um, as being associated with you. I mean, even. I mean, thinking of just how the senses kind of form, um, our first sense as we develop is touch. In the womb, at about six months, you can begin to see brain activity that ties to touch um, stimuli. And how did we manage to map a child? Yeah, I know it's kind of crazy. Yeah, how did this we is do actually that? it's a it's a it's a vogue potential work. So just looking to see if there's uh, kind of a change in brain waves. Um, at, at that early, it's kind of crazy, crazy work. But uh, but it's also the first sense to mature too. And our our skin. Here's like the one of the mind blowing things. So if you think about, um, and actually there's some really interesting footage of kind of development that came out recently. So right, we started as like a sperm and egg, and then we're this like this like cell that begins to divide and divide and divide and divide and divide until it looks like a raspberry, and then it continues turns into like different layers. So. We have this thing called endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, which are kind of like three kind of primordial kind of layers that turn into like all these other organs. So, ectoderm is is your skin, right? Is that's where your skin comes from? But what else comes from ectoderm? Your whole nervous system. Mm. I mean, that's amazing, right? Mm. So, our we kind of fold into this like person that um, where a lot of the things that you see on the skin, you can also see in the brain. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, so, yeah, especially the, what are, what are they called, the, the, the... The neural tube formation? The tube formation? Yeah. What's that, it, what, there's another word for it, with this, that, that, where they fold down the folds in the brain. What are those called again? A sulci, or sulci. Sulci, yeah. Yeah, so one yeah. is a sulcus, and then plural yeah. sulci. Yeah, sulci. sulci. <laughs> and then, and so then that can also be visible maybe on your, on the, like on these crevices on, on your skin. Apparently the only reason why we have such distinct and acute levels of touch is because of these ridges on our skin. If it was all flat, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have this distinct touch. We wouldn't feel yeah, it's it a as lot, much. Yeah, there's a lot of surface area for nerve endings, which can help it a ton. And I, I think the the point that you make is is really important. That the you know the vastness of the minute minute differences that you can see on someone's skin are actually not that different from the vastness of the number of differences that we can have brain to brain. Yeah. Um, from the level of individual cells in the brain to how those cells come together. I think one thing that people often forget about in the brain is that it's not just neurons, which typically kind of get all the attention, but there's also the cells that kind of create the insulation around the connections, there's yeah. the cells that support, there's the kind of cells that yeah. are involved in the immune system. Totally. I mean, like astrocytes, for example, are involved in kind of, are thought of the, as the glue, but the way that astrocytes work can actually influence how neurons work too, which adds a whole other massive layer of computation to how the brain works. Okay, I, we, I gotta unpack a couple things right now. <laughs> okay, um, one of the things that I wanna unpack is how the senses can connect to each other, mm -hmm. of course, which is, yeah, a lot yeah. of, which is a lot of your work. Mm -hmm. But also, maybe before we get there, we talk about a child you said in the womb is experiencing touch as mm -hmm. a first sense. Mm -hmm, yeah. And then when do we typically experience vision as a sense? When do we start getting into the other senses? Mm -hmm. And also, how does this affect our development as we were talking mm -hmm. about language and the importance of language for children right, when right. they're very young? Seeing uh, a sia, a chair, as well as a yeah. chair, right. as well as a um, s stool or whatever you yeah. want to um, um, call it, kriyasla. There's mm -hmm. so many words for it mm -hmm. across different languages. And what does that do to be able to perceive something in like six different languages? Yeah. And you can maybe that, we've heard a couple times on the show that in 
Um, in Hindi, there might be a couple dozen ways to mm -hmm. say something that there's yeah. only one way to say in, in English. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think what you're hitting on is, this con is, is the concept of concepts. So as your brain is experiencing the world, even through, through development, I mean, and development really, more than anything, has to, uh, the, the key things with development is timing and also how sensitive it is to kind of, kind of uh, adapting or kind of taking in that yeah. information, making those connections. But a concept uh, can involve a network of all these different neurons that are firing, all, the, all these different cells that are coming together. So for example, we can look at a chair Right, and your brain, um, when you're born, may actually see a blob that has no no concept to it. But as you're growing up, you're learning, like like someone's teaching you, this is called a chair. We sit in a chair, and as you, as you're growing up, you're also like, oh yeah, chairs can be hard. They can be made of wood or metal, um, and that begins to form this concept of chair, which yeah. has this vast network of color, wood, the sound that ties to to the concept of this as ch air, chair, mm -hmm. uh, to your, all your past memories of having been in a chair or fallen out of a chair or having like, had a very comfortable experience in a chair. I think one of the older models of how we thought about the brain was um, that the senses are kind of unitary, that they're kind of in their individual modules and they kind of, kind of connect with each other a little bit in between uh, and, and they all have very specific places in the brain where they can only be. And I think what we've learned is that things are much, much more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your, your brain can have a vision area just about really anywhere. And it just happens to be in the back part of the brain because anatomically, that's, it's just connected to the optic nerves mm -hmm. uh, of the eyes where it's getting a lot of that information. Um, but if you were to have like an injury, or here's a great example is um, people Olfactory with Olfactory is back here too, right? Uh, Olfactory is actually right in the frontal. Oh, it's up here. Yeah, yeah. So frontal okay. lobe is here. Cool. So if I were to just kind of like point like right in there, mm -hmm. um, there's like a plate that, that has, it's like a, like a cheese grater kind of plate where kind of neurons kind of come out and can take in that information. I mean, one of the cool, cool. things about olfactory Right here, nerves, right here, through the nose, yeah, um, smell. So the olfactory nerves are the only part of your brain that are exposed to the air. Oh, that is cool. Isn't that crazy? They're exposed to the actual air. Yeah. I recent when I recently learned a couple months ago that the whole gastrointestinal tract is like, you know, exposed, I guess, to the air from this side and mm -hmm. then out your butt yeah, yeah. the other side. But this goes directly this is to crazy. your brain. So so the nerve are because that's that's how you take the particle from the air and then sell, smell whether or not the food is Good or not? Yeah, there's all sorts of. You need of that for survival. Different types of, uh, set, like, basically these nerve cells, these olfactory nerve cells that respond to different chemicals in the air. You can have, however many that respond to specific families of, of chemicals, um, and it just happens to go right into the frontal lobe, um, right in the, the front part of the brain, and that kind of information goes to the rest of the brain, and all these different senses are actually highly, highly, highly connected and integrated, much more than we thought in the past. So any concept, any smell, any sound uh, has a lot of um, a lot of these other senses. So for example, yeah. uh, a smell can actually have uh, color and texture and all these other mm -hmm. senses tied to it, usually below the level of consciousness. You don't yeah. know that it's going on, but it's a concept that you've developed. But in there's these people with synesthesia mm -hmm. uh, that are usually consciously aware of how the, their senses can be highly, highly connected. Oh, so would it be maybe something like smelling the food that you're about to eat and maybe then knowing what color that food is and then seeing a little bit those colors being a little bit more bright? Yeah, whatever, whatever that concept is. Yeah. So for example, uh, if you were to smell, let's say you were to smell like baby powder, right? Mm -hmm. If your concept is, is heavily kind of grounded in the vision... All of a sudden you're seeing babies yeah, and baby babies butts and, and maybe and white or something yeah, like that. <laughs> exactly. And people with synesthesia, it can be a little quirkier than that. So for me, baby powder, the smell of baby powder very specifically is like a light blue color. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why people with synesthesia can actually um, uh, can tell the difference between different senses uh, more so than people without synesthesia. So there's one interesting study that was done looking at olfactory color or smell color synesthesia and they found that, that people who had smell color synesthesia were much more attuned to uh, not just identifying smells 
but also telling the difference between two different smells. Um, yeah. It's one of the reasons why someone with, with uh, kind of smell color synesthesia might actually be a really good sommelier, a really good wine taster. Yeah. There's one guy named Jamie Smith. Um, mm. He's out in, uh, out in out in the West, and he's been kind of named by Food and Wine as like one of the mm. world's best sommeliers uh, more than once. And he has kind of this like taste, smell, kind of color synesthesia. And you can likely also train that in yourself or in a child over time to get them, like you said, with this experiment with the bunny in the corner. Yeah, the I drum. think to a degree we can train a lot of these different experiences. I mean, our, our brain again is like so plastic. I wonder what would happen if you really trained a child across the senses very strongly to have synesthesia mm. across the senses. What would that person end up looking like? It depends. It depends. So uh, part of it is biology and the other part is the environment or like that training or the experience. So people with synesthesia typically um, also have a different biology. So uh, people with synesthesia are often genetically different and their brains look and work differently compared to other people. And work done by um, a Julie Simner out in the UK at looking at kind of development and synesthesia. Well, actually, I'll take a step back here and say that um, you're, you're right in that um, just about everybody has synesthesia up until about age two. Mm. Um, and then it typically goes away as our mm. brains begin to do this process called pruning. So like we're cutting out excess connections. Yep. Yeah. Cutting out excess connections because your brain wants to save energy, it wants to be yeah. very efficient. And so yeah. Pruning is essentially like getting rid of roads to make room for highways. And that highway might be like your mom's name and your dad's name and exactly. like how to get to the bathroom from your yeah. room. Or reading or reading. or like yeah. these concepts Literacy. of like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when, you know, when we're babies, we're all like hyper, hyper connected. But these people with synesthesia, it seems like they may not be pruning as much or their brains may be making more connections. Than other I really people. like or, your analogy about getting rid of roads for highways. Right, right. Yeah, that's a yeah. good one. Yeah, and so the people with synesthesia may have these kind of quirky connections that don't make sense to a lot of people. But these connections, just like everybody else, will typically form uh, maximally during this early developmental period of life. So uh, kids will typically develop their synesthetic associations uh, uh, the most kind of around ages four all the way up to like age 10. It's it's usually happening until like, I mean, uh, very, very early. one really fascinating study that was done by David Eagleman looking at... I love David Eagleman. Yeah. <laughs> so he, uh, he had a website where people could kind of like plug in their synesthetic associations and one of those was their uh, number letter color association. So that's called graphene color synesthesia where people will have a very, uh, very reliable, consistent and very vivid uh, color tied to every single letter or number. Uh-huh. Um, and um, wow. so, for example, like for me, the word cat, letter C is black, letter A is red, and letter T is red orange. Even mm-hmm. though it's might be, the whole thing might be written in black, mm-hmm. uh, for me, like there's also kind of like an additional color layered on top yeah. where C is black, A is red, T is red orange. And altogether, it's kind of this like cloud of like black and red and red, red orange. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so for people who, um, so he collected this like, large, large number of, of associations of people, and they found that there were some kind of similarities between people. So one similarity is that high-frequency letters are typically brighter. Mm. So A-E-I-O-U. vowels, yeah. for sure, yeah. um, were brighter. Um, the letter A typically was like a bright red. Um, Low-frequency letters were like darker. C or X. Exactly, or yeah. typically like a black kind of a color. Yeah. But then there's just one group of people that had a lot of similarities in their alphabet, in the color kind of alphabet associations, and they weren't sure why. Uh, so they, they tried to, they dug into this a little bit more, and they saw that they were all around the same age overall. And so they, they dug it into even further, and they saw that they were all around about four to six years old in the early 80s, which is around the same time that Fisher Price released a set of alphabet magnets. Oh, yeah, the ones that go on the fridge. <laughs> right, right. And so a lot of those magnets, though their colors tie colors. to the synesthetic association. That's so color. interesting. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with those magnets, and uh, one yeah. of my favorite kind of, um, one, some of my favorite magnets are the ones that tie to, to my colors. Yeah. 
Oh, that's so nuts. <laughs> And, and even then, uh, with the way that kids learn literacy, if the letters are colored whatever color they are, then that will tie them in um, synesthetically over time. I wonder if there's a way to maximize their potential or outcomes mm. by having the, col- the letters be certain colors. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's a lot of work still being done in terms of how, how synesthesia can help inform education and learning. Um, and one of those ways that I think is, is important to, to notice is that really um, emphasizing an individual's learning style and how they perceive the world can actually make a big difference. So as an example of that, one other form, this is, we're going to keep going down layers of the rabbit hole. This is another layer down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm loving it though. <laughs> so um, one of the many forms of synesthesia that I have is known as ordinal linguistic personification, OLP, which is one that you can see in the in, you know people who have synesthesia. So ordinal linguistic ordinal personification. linguistic personification. So ordinal is like order, linguistic is language, personification is like personalities and characteristics. So just based off of that, does that have anything to do with Ziff's law? Um, maybe that maybe. The, the Pareto principle applies to our language. Oh yeah, so, yeah. I, so I think it I, I think it really does. So, like, from uh, for myself uh, and people who have o- o- OLP, um, numbers and letters have personality traits tied to them, too. It's, for me, it's, it's especially, like, my numbers don't just have colors. They're, like, people, too. So, like, uh-huh. the number two is, like, red with a little bit of violet, but it's also a very maternal, very feminine kind of number, uh-huh. kind of fierce. Uh, three is, like, a dark purple indigo color, but also very humble. It doesn't really, like, let on to others, like, how much to potential. It, it gets, like, it's really detailed. They're, so like, people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and this is part of this, like, process of kind of, like, the brain kind of making these, like, interesting and weird connections. Yeah. So you can think of in terms of learning, can you imagine two plus two, right? For If, if two plus two is a quantity for you, it makes sense that it's four, but what if... <laughs> two is this like fierce feminine number. If you had two plus two, what does that mean? Yeah. It's just a crowd of fierce feminine numbers. It doesn't make sense that they would turn into a, four. a blue four that's friendly and passive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And so that's, wow. a, that, that's a common uh, issue in arithmetic yes. um, with people who have OLP. And if, and if you are someone teaching math and you knew that you'd be able to tailor to maybe think about like, don't think about the number two as a person. Think of it as, like, two objects. Sure, Instead, sure. Two apples plus two apples equals four apples. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow, this is so awesome. Okay, how? <laughs> this is so interesting. Okay, how about... Um, how about with me when I listen to someone speak Mm -hmm. and this will piggyback a little on the Pareto principle and Ziff's law but Mm -hmm. we have the word the or and or of or which or Mm -hmm. to these words that are filler words between the main words Mm -hmm. those words don't really create a spark for me in what way can you say they don't create a spark because they're said so often one out of every six words Mm -hmm. we say is a the yeah, so yeah. I, I almost even tune out sometimes the mm. word the, and I'm tuning in for your keywords. Yeah. So maybe when you say a word like epistemology, for me, mm. that categorizes you, or ontology, right? That categorizes mm. yeah. you into a category of thought of like, oh, you're like analyzing the nature of being yeah. um, to a certain degree already, yeah, that yeah. you at least know that. Mm-hmm. Or when you do talk about maybe the word uh, empathy and compassion and you talk about that at least you're thinking about it so Mm. maybe that can be a more friendly word for Mm. me like those words are more friendly maybe they're more pink and purpley and then um, (laughs) epistemology and ontology are maybe a little bit more green in nature and bluey yeah so you're you're exactly right I think you're hitting on two kind of big spheres of ideas so one is um, the concept of of, of salience, essentially, and like meaning tied to like this, the sensory kind of bundle that's being provided. So any word can lose meaning or salience when repeated enough. Yeah. So for example, let's say like the word and like bottle, 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 bottle. You say it enough times, and eventually you're like, what? that's like an alien word. Like it's it doesn't alien. make sense yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's like whoa, whoa bottle. And that's when you're when you're losing that that concept that ties around around it. And now the, it is, so as, you, the, as you kind of highlighted, like articles, conjunctions can have some of that too, yeah. some of that feeling where it may not have that much salience tied to them, but they're still kind of involved 
in the process below the surface. It's just not important enough that your that your body is saying, "Ooh, pay attention to that," or "Ooh, these are things yeah. to feel around here." Yeah. Um, now the other kind of big idea here is uh, one model for neuros, like the, thinking about how the brain works. It's called predictive coding, which ties into another kind of like big model of the free energy principle. But essentially, fr- predictive coding is all about uh, your brain is this organ that is there not not to it's it's there to predict the future first and foremost and so the whole idea behind memories is not that memories are particularly nice but that memories help to pr- get away from predators help you to understand that like this this thing here is going to support called, me. it's going to support you yeah, exactly yeah. and if something happens that you don't expect your brain is going to really hone in on that so that way you learn hey this can happen yeah Um, so that's one of the things that makes survival make, mechanism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's one of the things that makes like magic tricks so cool, right? Or um, surprises so awesome, or awe mm-hmm. so so amazing is yeah. that your your brain will suddenly trigger this physical response through hormones, through increasing your heart rate and your blood pressure, and and kind of releasing glucose and cord- all these things that kind of relate to that we could relate to like being aroused, being alert. Um, When something doesn't match the prediction that we that we make, and so uh, conjunctions and articles, as you were saying, like the and of and and, your brain is just like, yeah, whatever, like keep going, like this is like smooth. But if you get a word that you didn't expect, yeah, you're like, yeah. Whoa. whoa, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you can do that yeah. with with any predictive pattern. So like um, like uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we're just like very story driven species. Yeah. We find patterns in random things. That's called like the Ramsey principle. Where I mean, you look up at the sky and you'll see like a, a crab or a yeah. dog or a yeah. horse, even though it's like randomly, dis- like relatively randomly distributed. Yeah. Or if you were to kind of like all the the alphabet soups and the yeah, Cheerios exactly, and cereals exactly. and stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We we will find the pattern and we'll I create found a Abe story. Lincoln in my chip. Yeah, totally. we'll create a whole story as to why that's significant. Yeah, um, and so. Uh, and post it, it on Reddit and get ten thousand upvotes. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> Or even like music is this, a, another kind of beautiful example of that. Is that there's chord progression that we're we've been like learned yeah. essentially, um, and there may be some genetic component uh, to that as well because people across various cultures can have similar kind of predictions of what the next kind of note should be, um, but like very programmed things. So like think of like Beethoven, like banana, uh, and ba-na-na-na. you're already hearing. But what if you were here like Banana, do, 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 do. yeah. Then I'd be like, "Whoa!" Yeah, it that, creates yeah, like a like yeah. a weird kind of a feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that's a predictive error. Happy birthday to me. Yeah, and exactly. It's like, What? Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's comedy. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That, yeah. I mean, when people talk about comedy, you're coming running in people into their predictive mechanism, and all of a sudden you're like, "Nope." Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so that creates this like. This physical sensation that can be pleasurable, it can be painful, it can be uh, it can so be like making you really alert. Yeah, I feel like Bo Burnham did that decently well. He would take you into the predictive, and then he would just drop oh yeah. I mean, that's, I thought if you if you look at a lot of comedy, at the heart of it is this idea: we create a world, you create a set of expectations, and then we just rock that rock expectation. That. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, okay. good suspense, good thrillers, good movies. I mean, that's at the core of it. Yeah. Um, all right, let's come on our on our on our <laughs> on our end of closing there's so much to talk <laughs> about and i'm i'm excited to continue the conversation we'll definitely have some more parts to this once we uh get out here more you come out there more to sf how about we talk about overall um brain health mm-hmm. yeah yeah teach us about what you've been un- uncovering yeah as so a lot of the work that uh, we're doing at the mccann center for brain health at mass general is thinking about the brain from a more positive health oriented kind of point of view so right now the way that that healthcare typically works is bad thing happens we fix it right yeah why not think about preventing that bad thing from happening in the first place correct and so we're we are applying that model and bringing people in and becoming kind of like a primary care doctor for the brain so we figure out what are your risk factors what are your protective factors and how we can we Tune things up so that way your brain can be as healthy as possible for as long as possible, yeah. uh, and so that can mean uh, just 
One is understanding all that we know about in terms of evidence that's available from public health research, from epidemiology, and, and applying it very practically to the appropriate level of evidence that's there. Um, so that can mean saying, all right, how much are you exercising? Because exercise really does a, it, it has a, plays a very important role in the health of your brain by reducing uh, so many different risk factors. And it, it's partly you know, getting your heart beating and your blood vessels kind of being healthier, but also it's like something that you're learning. It is, it is actually stimulating the brain. So like taking dance, for example, is something that we recommend often because it's got a combination of the exercise, it's got a, the, the, the learning, mm -hmm. right? And it's also got the socialization aspect of it. And that's yeah. kind of another end of kind of like the research that I do is looking at how social relationships, you know, how we connect with people does influence our brain's health. It can be very positive, it can also be harmful too. And so it is being better armed with this information can help us live, live more fulfilling, more like healthier lives. And so you can be your, like the best version of yourself. Um, as possible, and why not take it from the standpoint of the brain? Um, because the brain and, and your body, your brain and your body are just, just so so linked together. Yeah. Um, that that really addressing that can really go a long way. I like how you recommended dance. Yeah, because, totally. Because that totally makes sense. You're both doing some socialization, having to work with like mm -hmm. other men and women. You have to do the series of steps with your dancing. You have to get into a set of flow. Um, and you also doing the physical exercise. Um, another good one is what we've been learning with Adam Gazelli's lab uh, and Neuroscape and uh, being able to prescribe video games mm, um, yeah, yeah. for um, ADHD, for attention, for working right. memory, for yeah. all these different yeah. aspects of life. And so, you know, we're thinking instead of peaking cognition at 23 and then it's just the slow decline, yeah, yeah. well, why not figure out ways to keep cognition even higher over time and mm. um, all of a sudden you can be even more creative creative when you're 50 years old because you've been playing with these different uh, yeah. tools that we've built that that help maximize your mind's ability to um, to exercise uh, storing new thoughts um, storing more thoughts at a time in your mind yeah absolutely yeah. I mean that's at the, at the heart of our mission is it's uh, one of, I mean there's many different models for why these healthy things can actually be healthy and one of them is this idea of cognitive reserve which is as you're making new connections new roads uh, you have more left over so that way if you do develop a disease losing a couple of them you still have a connection that you can make there I mean some of the work that has been done in terms of social relationships which has also been echoed in some of my own work is people who are more socially integrated you know if you think of it as a mentally stimulating activity uh, at the end of their life if you look at their brains uh, no matter how much kind of Alzheimer's related disease they have in their brain, the people who are most socially integrated are least likely to have symptoms. Mm -hmm. So they, they could have yeah. had a lot of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, but you wouldn't have known it because they had a lot of these excess connections, most likely. And at the same time, uh, this, uh, you know, video games that you brought up, I, I think that's a, that's a really important example because uh, I think people who, uh, who want to get like brain training games and things like that, I think the key to, to know about that is that it's not about the game itself it's that it's challenging exactly. that it's creating new connections yes so it, it could be you know it could be crossword puzzles or sudoku but it, once you get kind of good at it it loses its effect so you want to switch to something else or keep it keep it as challenging as possible and there's a certain peak state of cha of challenge that you want to get from the game but also you don't want to be challenged so much that you fail all the time so there's this exactly. really delicate exactly. place to be at and as you get better the challenge level increases mm -hmm. Um, okay, so brain health is obviously crucial. I thought what you were describing a second ago was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so um, cognitive reserve is then me having a, a, a couple of these connections, and as maybe over time they prune, a lot of the roads go away, and then there's cognitive reserve is having at least one or a couple of these roads left, so that way I still at least can access yeah. this memory or this information. Yeah, the more connected your your brain's kind of cell networks are, the more likely you'll still get to the action or the memory or the concept that was there before. As you can imagine, as each neuron's being plucked or each connection's being plucked, there's um, there's the risk that you kind of cut, cut off a lot of them and you lose a memory or you lose mm -hmm. an experience or you use yeah. the name for something. Yeah. And so the idea is 
connect, connect away. Make as many connections as you can and in very kind of directed, really challenging ways, like really strong connections too. So that way, even if you lose a couple, it's like no big. You heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here. Be multidisciplinary, be <laughs> polymathic, learn about a lot of different <laughs> things. Right. And then you'll get these, these right. complex, diverse connections in your mind about the way that reality works. Learning is cool. <laughs> yeah, learning's cool, learning's fun. <laughs> Oh, that's a good point. Mm. So then there's the point of uh, understanding how reality works. Like, oh, how well, this grass, how, question. well, that, l- let's, reality. let's go to this, this example. Yeah. So for example, this, um, the grass, right? The grass is, uh, is getting energy from the star and then growing. Mm-hmm. and energy from the soil and growing right, and right. water and yeah, growing. Yeah. So these things come together and there can be one person's reality is that that's how it works. Mm-hmm. And the other person's reality can just be like, oh, it's just green stuff on the ground and yeah. that's what I know about yeah. it and that's it. So there's different different realities about about that. So yeah. how, how do we balance? And, and You'll know grass. something else. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. that really disintegrates a lot of those concepts or you're, I mean, the, you, yeah, you, you, you get a, a lot of information that's crossing, connecting ways that it wouldn't normally connect. And so that's yeah. where, like, reality or concepts are suddenly blur. Yeah. But the, the idea that, um, you know, there are physical principles in the world that are consistent, um, but our perception of it or how we talk about it ties to probabilities. You know, science is all about under, getting uncertainty to be a little less uncertain. Yes. Because getting to 100% certainty is highly, highly, highly improbable. Like a point line or a plane in geometry. Like they're undefined for a reason. It's because you can only get so much before your tools are unable to really measure those things. And so, um, you know, there's, um, there's, there's that element of it. But there's also kind of a social reality. So you and I can look at this and agree that it's a chair. Uh, because you and I have had similar experiences or similar environments or similar enough that we can both acknowledge that this is a chair. But there's like the finer grain kind of experience that you had of the chair so that this has a different charge for you than it does yeah. for me. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe I was an arborist in a past life. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, I was, and I'm like, now I'm like, I don't know about these wooden chairs. I prefer the metal ones. Yeah, maybe, or, yeah. maybe I fell out of a chair like this. And when I see this, I'm like, oh, this is not good. Yes, yes. All right, how about we touch on a little bit on the magic mushroom and side I, of things? I, 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 <laughs> yeah. Before we go, further, go ahead. On, um, um, uh, I don't want to lose it. Uh, I lost it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's I'm okay. Focused. Well, yes. because what we thought, what we were talking about earlier, I thought was really good, which is mm-hmm. that synesthesia creates this blend of senses, but then also we have the mind-altering substances, mm-hmm. LSD, psilocybin, mm-hmm. 5-MeDMT, there's so many of these different ones. Even mm-hmm. cannabis is a mind-altering, <clears throat> alcohol mm-hmm. is. But what, how do they impact the way that our senses get blended? And mm-hmm. then that's almost, they, get, they come in for the short term, just like a couple hours mm-hmm. of the sense blending. And then there's also the effect on the neurology of the uh, serotonin 2A receptor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then that is... Um, this overwhelmingly interest in maybe in reality mm-hmm. and in all these different senses. Yeah. So yeah, unpack this for us a bit. So the idea of like a, so a hallucinations and hallucinogens, part of it is kind of really getting at this mechanism of predictive coding. So like guessing, right? So your brain is constantly making guesses about the world. Like I'm guessing that I'm going to be in this chair another second yes that it won't just suddenly disappear yes i'm guessing that like a dragon will not appear yes. out of here but um, it might rain but it, but it might rain exactly yeah. and so uh with these uh, hallucinogens they're substances that are getting at the basic mechanisms of these cells so it is an example like lsd specifically affects the serotonin type 2a receptors which has actually been implicated uh, in, in synesthesia as well as one of the many potential ways that synesthesia can develop. But um, you can imagine that if you are making uh, a lot of excess connections uh, and, or, or, and or you're making it harder for your brain to filter out guesses, you're just making all sorts of guesses. We're even like... Um, Interesting. So like, for example, if I'm looking at this grass right here, I might suddenly start to make patterns where there isn't a pattern. So like... 
I can start to see like a person's face or like this cloud is like not just looking like a rabbit, it's a rabbit that's talking to me. Mm -hmm. Because your brain is making like wild goose chase type of guesses about the world around you. It's like too many for your for your for your brain to be able to filter out like what makes sense and what doesn't. And typically Occam's razor is the best solution, which is that the simplest solution is right. usually right. It's probably just a bunch of yeah. grass. I mean one of the speculations as to why some of these hallucinogens can actually be potentially helpful in kind of mood disorders and things like that is that um, at the heart of some of these disorders is actually uh, uh, a kind of an error in predictions. Um, so uh, one researcher, uh, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, who um, uh, does a lot of work on emotions and what emotions really are, a lot yeah. of these concepts. But uh, one way that she kind of frames the idea of like anxiety and depression as an example is someone with anxiety might be someone who just makes a lot of predictions about what's going to happen. So for example, um, if they hear like a rustling in a, in a bush, it's not just the wind potentially. It could be like a bear or a saber-toothed tiger or a snake and all those predictions relate to like danger and harm and threat and just thinking about that harm might as well be real harm because your, 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 your brain, you know, it's this mechanism that's creating simulations. Those simulations are very, very real in your brain. Yeah. Um, someone who's depressed may have a metabolic disorder that also makes it really hard to step out of a prediction. So you mm -hmm. might have like a loop of like some, something very traumatic that's happened in your past. So you're constantly making predictions that the world is the worst, the world yeah. is awful, or like Correct. me moving ha will have zero impact on a good thing in the, in the, in the world. Yeah. Um, so the, the idea behind, you know, or some of the speculation around how hallucinogen might be helpful is that because there's so many guesses, it kind of resets the whole system yeah so that way you can make new predictions yes. or kind of challenge old predictions that you had i uh, mean that's in, so interesting you might not even need to use a hallucinogen to Correct. be able to do some of this i mean Correct. curiosity yeah is a really important skill which is you know just asking questions about you know how likely is that there, there's a saber-toothed tiger in a bush well let me think about or that. when you look at your watch you finally go what the fuck is time <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Or it's like, um, if you're, yeah, you're, 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 you're running late for something. It's like, oh, what does that really mean? mean yeah. yeah. Am I gonna die? No. Am I being late? Am I gonna get cancer? <laughs> no. no. Yeah. So why would I be pissed? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think just having a better sense of your brain, like, kind of this, this kind of thing that we're all born with, uh, really helps to just be a more chill. More chill. <laughs> more chill. Yeah. But then we get into the conversation that Ron brought up, which I think is going to be talked about a lot more uh, on this on the on the show over time, because it's so difficult to understand whose subjective realities overlap to understand the world objectively. Because mm -hmm. if we do come up with a subjective seven and a half billion people yeah. say that the Earth orbits the star, yeah, yeah. okay, great, mm -hmm. we're set. That's yeah. done. It's a round Earth. Okay, great. It's a collaborative approach, and if you think about like a the way that people interact kind of like the way that brain cells interact yeah if you have the vast majority of the brain cells saying that like the, you know the, this is a chair yeah. then you're gonna say that it's a chair if the vast majority of people believe that the, that the earth is round you could you could decide to challenge it but also acknowledge that there's probably some there's probably a lot <laughs> to, to that understanding that that exactly. the earth is is it, there's, it's highly, 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 highly certain that the Earth is round. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I argue that it's, it's um, the vast majority. There is no vast majority. For, for, for my eyes, it appears that the world is split down the middle on uh, this, the scientific mind where you said earlier that uh, science removes uh, certain things of uncertainty. And then there's... Uh, uh, half, you know, that understand that and objectively go forward and yeah, chill, yeah. that chill mind, mm -hmm. the brain gives us the uh, ability to just chill out and, and continue the debate, but then there's a, another half, uh, faith-based, uh, ignorant, and uh, mm -hmm. violent, yeah. and refuse to uh, accept these uh, remarkable breakthroughs that we've established here in this timeline mm -hmm. at 2018. So how do we get the vast majority yeah. to, to, to chill, like you say? Well, I think a, a, a big part of what you're alluding to, like each of these words, these are concepts, right? And these concepts are part of larger networks, and these networks they relate to salience, 
the veil. And so like importance, but also these physical sensations, identity as well, like who you are. If someone's attacking a concept that you identify as yourself, it might as well be like they're punching you or attacking you. Um, and so a lot of work that's being done in psych psychology looks at things like what's called affect or, or mood. Um, but like memories, thoughts, these concepts are tied to physical experiences. And so I think coming at someone in a way that's threatening is not going to create a bridge, right? Uh, so, I mean, one, one thing that I think is important to note is if you want to... If you want to make friends, you have to be a friend first, yeah. right? If you want to make connections with somebody else, you have to let them know that it's okay to make a connection. That can mean finding areas where you agree. Like, yeah. we, 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 are, we are human. I mean, you can start at the most fundamental level. We are human. Yeah. You were a child once. Yeah. I was a child once, too. We both speak this language. We spoke, speak this we language. We have hearts. And slowly yeah. building that up creates more connections between the two of you. And this is kind of this whole other area of uh, the mirroring systems of the brain and, and who you relate with. The more you're, you're open to f relating to the other person, seeing them as, that, as though they're a part of you or that you're, yeah. um, at they are, as they are you, the more likely you are to have positive feelings towards them, yes. to be empathetic, to have similar sensations, yeah. to be compassionate, meaning to, to wish them well, and yeah. to be kinder to them, to actually take actions that will be there to relieve suffering and to be good towards them. Yeah. And you can imagine that helping people to kind of agree on something that you might see fundamentally, like how can you, how could you believe that, coming at them from that from, from that starting point is unlikely to work. Yeah, Because you are just as crazy to them as, as they are to you. I love how you tied it back into mirror neurons as well, is that when you do see somebody, just know that you're both human, first of all. You're both speaking the same language. You both have hearts, at least. If you start with these very basic, mm -hmm. bare level yep. mm -hmm. um, points, then at least you're not going to immediately try and create a cut like between them, that you believe something that I don't believe, that's it. We're not good anymore. Yeah, there's and some really great work um, specifically looking at that concept using like virtual reality. Um, and even like just basic kind of um, what they call kind of entrainment type of task, but essentially if it, in this virtual reality example, if you are enter into a virtual reality world where you look like someone that doesn't look like how you physically look, afterwards you're more likely to have positive thoughts and associations with that person. So it's like, imagine I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a younger white woman in this virtual world though, I'm an older black man, I'm looking at myself in this mirror as this older black man afterwards, I'm more likely to have positive thoughts towards yeah. this out group. That, that's a very good one, I like that one. So looking in a mirror in VR and seeing something that's not you and being like, oh, that's what I would look like if I was an Asian man or if I was a black woman. And Because and, you begin to identify that yeah. type of person as you. As you, exactly, which is exactly what we were talking about. And that builds up empathy, builds up compassion. And I think it will eventually get us to what Ron was talking about, which is a greater collective understanding for how to move forward in society. Um, okay, uh, Joel, let's ask you a quick question about, uh, we have these simulation questions that we like to ask. And All right. this, this has been one that we talk about a lot, and so we like to press people about it to see what their thoughts are, but it really piggybacks on the last question well. but. Although the Pinker argument's true that everybody's slowly going up in terms of socioeconomic status across the world, mm -hmm. um, technology is kind of exacerbating wealth inequality for mm -hmm. the super, super mm -hmm. rich. What do you think we're going to do about that gap of wealth inequality? How do we work together across the world in this globalized world? How do we collaborate across borders? Yeah, yeah. I think one element of it is kind of ties into this mirror touch or mirroring system kind of element. So being empathetic, compassionate, like really seeing others as as being similar to yourself, so that way you're able to take actions, so that way you're thinking of everyone's welfare. So I think that's one one big bucket, which to me I think is an important one. I mean, could you imagine what the world would look like if you didn't just think about what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes, but also feel what it's like to be in their shoes? Um, yeah. To then reason through their experience and come at it from a place that's uh, more compassionate and kinder, and also truer and more enduring. Um, Another element of it, I think even more practically, is actually um, something that will, will be released pretty soon by Andrew McAfee, um, where he really talks about this concept of dematerialization. Yes. Which I think is a, is an, is a really important concept Super to, to, to remember. Yeah. Which is 
Uh, as technology advances, things get smaller. As things get smaller, they're likely to require less resources and Correct. create less waste, yes. which makes it easier, uh, and things get cheaper too, yes. so it makes it easier to to distribute some of these um, some of these capacities and capabilities across the population. Yep. It can help with uh, overall development of the world, and also has a very strong and important environmental impact. Yep, uh, another huge, th right. yes, exactly. Yes. It doesn't preclude you from having it, because it's digital now, um, and then the amount of waste mm -hmm. that, uh, the Peter Diamandis wrote about it as well, is we're not spending as much money on um, these things like conference calling, it's now free, it used to right. cost thousands of bucks. Right. And I think yeah. for, for everyone, regardless of what you're working on or doing, it's so important to be as thoughtful as you can about it. And being thoughtful means thinking about it so, throw so many different lenses, from the lens of an environmentalist or a humanist, or from the perspective of someone who is a lower uh, socioeconomic status or higher socioeconomic status, because everything you do has an impact. And the things that uh, do the most good for, for you and for the planet, for the species, like finding that happy marriage takes a bit of thought because you don't want to be be the person who like rushes to develop a technology that ends up like annihilating us. Yeah, correct. <laughs> so being and there's plenty of things that we can't predict, but I think just being as thoughtful as possible and being open to being corrected and making changes, like I yeah. think that that's key. I really like how you finally brought it even back again to mirror touch and the idea of empathy and compassion and what we need across the planet in order to see people more like ourselves and I really like the VR experience that you listed. I think that's a really interesting example of how we can relate to each other. Um, synesthesia, the blending of the senses, neuro neurology, all aspects to it from, from while you're being formed inside of somebody all, <laughs> all the way out to when you're trying to retain cognitive capacity when you're 80 years old. So there's this incredible tr journey that everybody goes on. and. Uh, and our world is formed in different ways. All that we know is our nervous system. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Joel, such a pleasure. Thank you well, so much likewise. for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone, thanks for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We're here at the Harvard Medical School campus uh, in Cambridge. We are in Cambridge. No, we're not in Cambridge anymore. The we're medical now. school is in Boston proper. It's in Boston but proper. But the university is in Cambridge. The university is in Cambridge, but because the medical school is in Boston proper, we are here right now. Uh, we are very grateful that it didn't rain. We are grateful that you tuned in. Thank you. This is a beautiful lawn here at the medical school campus. Um, if you guys had a good time, give us a comment below. Let us know your thoughts. Subscribe. Join us. Like the video. Share it with other people and get talking. Get talking about the importance of all of this information. Join us on Patreon. We need your help so we can continue sustaining this and growing it. And we will see you guys soon. Peace.